So this is the temple liturgy of the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. <clears throat> you ready? <laughs> I don't know if I am. I'm just praying that it'll be plain to you. If my mind is spinning a little bit. So, liturgy, the, the temple liturgy. Liturgy. That, that means what again? The liturgy is the actual uh, process or rites or rituals that the priest did as he went through the sanctuary. Oh. So the application of the blood, the slaying of the lamb, when he went here and then he stood here and then he went here and he stood there. It's the, it's the liturgy. It's kind, of like, it's, it's kind of like what this is, right? Okay. You have, you have a, a bulletin and it tells you what's going to happen. This is the liturgy. So we're going to sing, we're going to have prayer, we're going to sing a song, we're going to kneel in prayer, we're going to, you know, these, this is the liturgy of, of the sanctuary, of our worship. Well, the, the book, the Bible has a liturgy of the, the sanctuary that the priests actually did. Because God had laid this plan, God had made this plan at the foundation of the world, according to scripture, we'll see later. But yeah, so this plan was in the mind of God of how to save humanity. And so he started to tell, he started to tell right away, Adam and Eve, he started to tell them the process of what was going to take place. And he built, he started, kept adding to that process so that we would understand more and more what the process was. And we call that this type or this pattern, the liturgy. It's the liturgy of the, temp, of the sanctuary. Does that make sense? Thank you. Very good. Please, if you see a word that I put up there that doesn't make sense, please ask me what it means. So, the first thing that takes place, you, you, okay, the Bible is written in structures, okay, it's, it's not just written haphazardly, that the Bible actually has structure to it, and the structure of scripture actually begins to explain to you what, what is going on and why it's going, what is most important, so it has form and it has function. Right, so the structure of, of what's written, they're called chiastic structures because the chiasm actually begins to explain all the information that it, that it has. And then at the top of the, the chiastic structure, the, the, it, after the letter chi is an X. So it starts and then it builds up. What's in the center is what's most important. Okay, and I actually, I think I actually explained, well, I have that different presentation for that. But the idea here is that the book of Leviticus chapter 16, you'll see is broken into three parts. So the first part, verses 1 through 11, is the preliminaries. It tells you the preparation for the Day of Atonement. Remember I talked to you, every time you have this important meeting, there's a preparation that takes place. Leviticus chapter 16, verses 1 through 11, are the preliminaries, the, the explanation, the, the preparation and the explanation of what's going on. And then what happens in Leviticus 16, chapters, verses 12 through 28, this is the principal rites. By the way, this is going to be the essence of the liturgy. This is going to tell you the movements of the priest. And then the final systemization is going, to, is going to conclude the whole process. So you have this, you, you see this A, B, and then A process. Okay, so what I'm going to first going to do, when I highlight it in red, I'm showing you that, what that section is. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from that section to the second section. The principal, principal rights section, section B, that's the part that's actually going to tell you where the priest is and where he moves to and what that means. And I'll explain to you what that means afterwards. But, but I'll tell you, it's, it's very beautiful. The Bible is not written haphazardly. The Bible is written very specifically. It's a beautiful work of God that explains the process of salvation. It's poetic. It, it, it's, just, it's just beautiful. And it explains itself. And, and this structure is important because God knew that we would come along and try to make the Bible say what we wanted it to say. But when you see that it has structure and what it means, the structure tells you what it means, and I can't say it means something it doesn't say. Right? There's a lot of people running around twisting the Bible to make, them say, make it say whatever they want it to say. But no, the Bible explains itself, and that's what Dan was mentioning. That no prophecy is given by, by the person or its own interpretation. It comes from God. The Word of God comes from God. I'm supposed to go to the Word of God, and as I read the Word of God, as I wrestle with the Word of God, then the Word of God changes my thinking, changes the way I see reality. I'm supposed to be changed by the Word of God. I'm not supposed to change the Word of God to fit me. Amen. And this is part of the struggle that's going on in the world. Many people are running around saying they believe this book, and then they twist it to say, make it say whatever they want it to say. That's the problem. But we're, we want to draw truth out of the Word. We don't want to push what we think in the Word. Does that make sense? So this, this structure thing may seem 
confusing to someone just introduced to it, or it may seem trivial to some others, but the point is that this is the surety of the Word of God, that it is the Word of God, and there's structure to it. So I'm just going to quickly go through the preliminaries, and here's the structure of the preliminaries. And yeah, there's structures within structures. <laughs> yes, it's, it's <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of fractals or this idea, there's the pattern within patterns. God is just amazing. So you see, for example, if you look at, if you went to school and you looked at an atom, and it has the protons and the neutrons, right? And then and outside it has the electrons. Okay, so if you look at an atom and then you look at the universe with the sun and the moon and the stars, they look the same, don't they? One is a miniature of the other. One is a picture of the universe with the sun and the, earth and the planets going around it. And the other one is a, a, a proton and neutrons in the center with the electrons going around. Well, they look the same because they are the same. One is a pattern of the other. And so you, there's, there's these patterns within patterns. Because that's how God, that's the mind of God. And by the way, we want to be in touch with the mind of God. So you'll see this pattern. You'll notice that it begins, the, it begins with the death of Aaron's sons, which is, uh, again, takes us back to Leviticus chapter 10, as I told you. And, and then Aaron's warning, because of what happened to his sons. And then, of course, the promise, and I... The promise is what I shared with you earlier, that promise is exciting. And then Aaron's instruction for the sin offering and the burnt offering. Then Aaron's attire and washing. And notice the highlight here is the sin offering and the burnt offering. The preliminaries focus on the offerings because the offerings reflect the blood of Christ that prepares us to become one with God. So the, the offerings are important because they, they, they point to the, the, the crucifixion of Christ. After that, it's an Aaron, notice it says Aaron shall offer the bullock, and that's explained. Aaron presents the two goats, that's explained. He casts lots upon the goat, that's explained. Aaron brings the Lord goats as a sin offering, that's explained. He sends away the scapegoat into, into the wilderness, that's explained. You notice these things are explained. They, don't hap they haven't happened yet, they're explained. In other words, this is what he's going to do and why he's going to do it, but it hasn't happened yet. Does that make sense? So the point is there's instruction and preparation before the event takes place. So I'm going to, these are the, the specifics again I just went over. Uh, and I don't have to go over them again unless you have any questions. But all these, the point of this slide is that all the preliminaries take place in the outer court. All the preparation takes place outside the sanctuary before they go in. Does that make sense? Okay. Aaron has to offer sacrifices for himself and for his family. Then, once he goes through that process, then he offers sacrifices for the people. So again, the sacrifices are specific. So these are the preliminaries. These are presenting the, the two goats before the, the, the door of the sanctuary. Notice that they're out where the people are. They're in the outer court. Right? They cast lots. The, 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 the one goat that's going to be sacrificed is chosen. The one goat that's a scapegoat is going to be set free is also chosen. Then it says that Aaron brings the bullock for the sin offering, which is for himself. He shall make atonement for himself and his house. He kills the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. This is the final preparation because now he's going to, get, now he's going to start the process of going into the sanctuary. And that's why we have... Uh, what I have is called the principal rites. This is the process of going in, into the sanctuary. I told you this is the technical stuff, but there's meaning behind it, so please just try to stay with me. But So this is the, the going, the, the, the principal rites has its own structure. Notice it's, it, the high priest is going to go into the most holy place three times. And then he's going to make an end of to, uh, toning. It's going to happen in three stages. And then at, at the live goat being let out, the, final, the, the systemization part, the live goat, there's going to be three people involved. So you notice the pattern of the threes. Three angels' message, eternal gospel. There's lots of, of value here. Actually, it goes back to the Godhead. There's three persons of the Godhead. Three is a number of eternity because it re represents God. So the point here is that it's the first part of it, the high priest is going to go into the most holy place three times. He's going to go in, he come out. Then he's going to go in, he's going to come out, and then he's going to go in again. Does that make sense? All right. So here we go. This is, this is from Leviticus chapter 16. So the preliminaries were verses, verses 1 through 11 were the preliminaries. All right. And that's, what, that, that's done in the outer court. So this is the first time he's going to be told to, that he goes into the most holy place. 
Now, this is important. The Day of Atonement, the day of atonement uh, is the only day of the year that the high priest goes into the most holy place. He, he does not go into the most, the most holy place any other time of the year. It's just on the Day of Atonement. So when he goes into the, day of, the most holy place, we know that it's the Day of Atonement, part of the Day of Atonement. All right? So the first thing he does in verse, in verse 12, it says, He shall take a censer full of burning coals from off the, from off the altar before the Lord. And you see the picture here uh, of the, high, the priest actually taking a pan of coals from the, from the altar. Is that All right? from the altar of burnt offering? Yes, because that was, the, uh, that was the place that the fire came down from God and started the fire, right? And it represented the cross. Yes, yeah. because, it, well, it actually represents God's fire. It's God's presence. God's fire literally came out and, and, and he started the fire on the altar burnt offering. So it wasn't started by human hands. This is what Nadab and Abihu got in trouble for. They started their own fire. No, that doesn't work. Right? Only God's fire. Because God is the only one who can atone for sin and save sinners. We cannot save ourselves. So that was Nadab and Abihu's mistake. So you see he takes, and I'm sorry, these are these pictures, but uh, he takes the, alt, the, the coals from the altar. He's going to place, place them in the censer in his hand. And he's going to do that, and then he's going to take handfuls of sweet incense, and he's going to take this, as well, I'll show you, take it into the, to the most white place. So every time he, before he goes in, he must wash. And I'll give you the text for that, Exodus 30, 20 21. Before, when he goes in, before he goes in, he has to wash. If, he did not, if they do not wash before they go in, they will die. That's how serious it is. Okay. So the idea is they have to wash, then they go in. And when they come out again, every time before they go in again, they have to wash. It happens every time. Okay? So you'll see this, is a, this whole day is a liturgy that they, they paid attention to. So this is the first entrance into the most holy place. He actually takes the entrance. See, his hands are full of sweet incense, beaten small. So we notice, here's the fire, the, 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 the coals from the fire are in the incense, the censer. And then he has in his other hand, he has the, the, the incense. And he doesn't put the incense on the censer until he goes into the most holy place. So there's no blood. There's nothing else going on. The, the, the high priest's hands are full. And there's no one else in the sanctuary when he goes into the sanctuary. You can see that also in Leviticus. Yes. Uh, the um, present day truth for application of washing for the individual before going before God. Is there... Some symbolic applications. Yes, yes, because when, when we're baptized, what are we doing? Mm. We're being washed in the blood of Christ, aren't we? It's his blood that washes away our sin. And we don't we we would never dare enter the presence of God in our own righteousness. No, we must be washed from our sin in the blood of Christ and covered with his atoning blood, covered with his righteousness. Paul says that in Ephesians that we are washed by the word, by the reading that's right. of the word. That's right. And he actually uses the word for labor there, right? The water yes. of the word, right. Yeah. So there, that's right. So there's, there's more than just the idea of one washing. You'll notice that even the, the individual parts of the sacrifice in Leviticus chapter 9, the parts were washed once they were sacrificed, then they were washed before they were presented. So there's multiple washings. By the way, how often do we ask God to forgive us for our sins and cleanse us from our unrighteousness? Is that just a one-time event? Or is that something that keeps happening? Right? The whole idea of the foot washing service is the idea that we need to wash because we walk in the sin of this world and we get dirt on us. We need to wash. Right? So yeah, it's a very good question. So you'll notice his hands are full. This is uh, of sweet incense beaten small, that's Leviticus 16, 12, verse B. And then he goes, he brings it within the veil. So this is the first time that he goes in to the most holy place. Leviticus 16, verse 12. And then it says, and he shall put incense upon the fire before the Lord. So this is when he puts the incense, the, the scent, incense itself on the censer. And so it wafts, starts to waft in the cloud. And then it says that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. So the cloud begins to fill the sanctuary, this cloud of incense. Does that make sense? And this is the first time that he enters, no blood. He just does incense, and then, and then he exits. He comes all the way out. First time in, first time out. This makes sense. Yep. Okay. 
Then it says he comes all the way out. He has to come all the way out. Actually, the, there's a person that's, he's killed the, blood, the, bull, the bull already, and there's a person in the outer court stirring the blood so it doesn't coagulate because he's going to go in and minister the blood. There's someone else standing in the outer court with the blood, and when he comes out, he's going to get this blood of the bull, and then he's going to wash himself again, and then he's going to go back in. So that's, why it's, that's what it says here in the next verse. He shall take the blood of the bullock. And he must again wash before he enters. And he goes into the most holy place. He shall take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And, he, and before the mercy seat he shall sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. So this is the sprinkling of the blood of the bull in the most holy place and the, on, the, on, on the mercy seat. Actually... The pictures are wrong. He's standing on the other side. To sprinkle eastward, he's facing outward. He's sprinkling this way. As if the, the ark is here and the exit is there. Most of the pictures they show you, they have the priest standing this way, facing the wrong way. But that's okay. They're not theologians. They're just artists. So. <laughs> but when you, when you begin to pay attention to detail, you begin to realize there's reasons for this. East, directions of eastward is going to be important. But anyway, he sprinkles the blood seven times and it's eastward. Okay, so when he does this, then, then he comes again. He comes all the way out. And what he's going to, how we know he comes all the way out is because the next verse is going to tell us, he comes all the way out, he's all the way out to the other court. What he's going to do is then he shall kill the goat for the sin offering that is for the people. So he comes all the way out and then he sacrifices the goat. Okay, and then of course you can see him uh, getting ready to sacrifice the goat while the people are standing watching. The people were part of the process. They could see it. Right? And then it says, Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people. So the, the bull is the sacrifice for himself and for the sins of his family. The goat is for the sins of the people. Then it says, again, he must wash before he enters. And then he brings the blood within the veil. So he brings the blood of the goat within the veil. This is the third time the high priest enters in to the most holy place. Okay, that fulfills the first, the first part of the principal rites. So he's, he started out there and he goes all the way in. So now he's in the most holy place. 